I'll make a start. So thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, for those who haven't attended a, an ADSET webinar before, um, my name's Darlene McLennan and I'm the manager of the Australian Disability Clearinghouse on Education and Training, ADSET for, for short. Today's webinar is being live captioned. You can access those captions by clicking on the CC button in the toolbar that is located either on the top or bottom of your screen. We also have the captions available in a, um, in, um, a browser. So Kylie will kindly put in that into the chat now for you all to access that if you'd like. Now, I just want to start by um, saying that I'm on Luchawitta, which is Tasmanian Aboriginal land. And the spirit of reconciliation, ADSET respectfully acknowledges the Luchawitta nations and also recognises the Aboriginal history and culture on the land on which we are and pay respect to elders past and present and to the many Aboriginal people who did not make elder status. I also want to acknowledge all the countries participating in this meeting and also acknowledge elders and ancestors and their legacies to us and any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders participating in the webinar. Um, I think like many of the online sessions we have around the country now, um, if you'd like to put in what lands you're on or acknowledge the, the custodians on the land on which you are today, please add that to the chat box. Um, it's a lovely way to know who's online for other participants, but also acknowledging that, um, yes, slowly we are all learning the lands we are on, which is absolutely fabulous. Okay, today's webinar, Inclusive Assessment for Students with Disability, is presented by Dr Joanna Tai a Senior Research Fellow at the Centre for Research in Assessment and Digital Learning, Cradle <laughs> is the name, at Deakin University. Um, it's fabulous to have um, Joanna join us today. Um, I think we were commenting prior to starting that this has kind of been in the pipeline for a number of years and it's finally, um, with our patients, um, we've finally got it happening. Joanne will share the findings from her research on how examination arrangements in higher education impact on students' experiences of inclusion and ways to improve inclusion in exams as part of a holistic approach to universal design for learning, um, which is very exciting. And we'll talk a little bit more at the end of Joanne's um, talk about some of the other things that we're doing at ADSET to support UDL across the tertiary sector. But before we begin, just a couple of housekeeping details. We, um, as I said at the beginning, this um, event is being live captioned by Sharon from Bradley Reporting, and it will be recorded, and the recording will be available on ADSET in the coming days. If you have any technical difficulties or are having any at the moment, you can um, email us at admin at adset.edu.au. Joanne's going to speak to us for 40 or 45 minutes. Um, then at the end, we'll have an opportunity to ask her some questions. So um, feel, if you'd like to ask Joanne some questions, you can put that into the Q&A box. Um, we also have enabled the upvoting, so you can choose which question you'd like um, asked first. So by ticking, um, clicking the upvote. Um, if you wanted to chat to each other or have some conversation throughout of more of an informal nature, we encourage you to use a chat box so that um, just we won't kind of get the questions from there, but we um, can chat to each other. All right, so I think that's all. So I'm going to hand over to you now, um, Joanna, and thank you once again for, for doing this presentation for us. Absolutely brilliant to have you online. Thanks very much, Darlene. Um, yeah, it's it's great to be here today. Um, just checking you, everyone, my slides are still displayed. So you yep, can see. all good. Yep, Thank all good. You. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm here to share um the findings of our Aneshi uh, funded project. Um, I would also like to acknowledge country. I am presenting to you from my home, which is on the unceded uh, lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I thank them for their care of the land and acknowledge that education has been happening here for a, a very long time and I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And the picture on the screen is um, a sculpture of Bunjil who is the one of the creators um, in the Kulin Nation's um, creation story. I would also like to acknowledge that um, while I'm here talking to you today, uh, this work uh, was actually that um, came about from the contributions of a number of people. So uh, firstly, the research team, Rola Ajawi, Margaret Bierman, Joanne Dargush, Mary Drakup, Lois Harris and Paige Marnie. 
also like to acknowledge that the research presented was conducted under the National Centre for Student Equity and Higher Education Research Grants Program. Um, and also that the staff, students and advisory group members were really crucial to where we ended up with the project. Um, and uh, yeah, we wouldn't have anything to present today without the contributions of all the participants. So today I will briefly outline why we're talking about inclusive assessment. Um, I'll spend some time talking about the findings of the research project on how exactly do exams impact on students' experiences of inclusion? Um, and there were two phases to that project. Then I'll talk to um, the implications overall for inclusive assessment and then um, step you through some of the project resources which we developed um, as well, which hopefully are a little bit more practical um, and might um, provide some tips for everyone. So what I'm gonna say first is probably not going to be a surprise to anyone here. Student diversity is definitely increasing in higher education, and this diversity is very broadly sort of considered. So there are multiple equity groups that we're talking about, not only disability, but also students from Indigenous backgrounds, from low socioeconomic status backgrounds, students in regional, regional rural and remote areas, um, and students who study in a non-traditional area. And while um, we might consider these as particular categories, the students themselves might not belong just to one category, or they might not even consider themselves as belonging to one of those ca categories. For certain groups, i.e. students with disability, we are morally and legally obliged to ensure that they have the same opportunities to demonstrate achievement. However, we also do know um, that some students do not actually disclose their conditions. And as a result of this, uh, it's quite difficult to actually ensure um, that they have access to accommodations and adjustments because we just don't know who they are. We, we, we can't do anything about that. So this um, diversity problem means that um, identifying diversity means that we need to have a different approach to how we do things. And in assessment, this is really important because we know that unequal outcomes persist. Um, and so I have a graph on the screen here, which demonstrates the Australian domestic student completion rates after nine years. So that takes into account part-time students. And we unfortunately don't have information for all those categories I was mentioning before, but from the ones that we do, we can see that students from a low socioeconomic background, from are rem studying remotely, so that's off campus, oh, sorry, remote as in remote location, regional locations, external, which is off campus, and Indigenous students all uh, don't enjoy the same rates of completion uh, as your standard traditional student. So my argument here is that assessment is one of these things that impacts on progress and therefore success. And we know from previous research that even when available, adjustments don't entirely address the needs of students. Um, and they can also make students feel more excluded. For instance, having to go sit in a separate room or have their um, exam at a different time. And the actual act of obtaining adjustments um, and ensuring that they're implemented for those individuals can still also create exam related stress and anxiety, which is not good because these students then end up spending more time um, being worried about what's happening about the accommodations for their exam rather than concentrating on the subject material and actually performing their best. So while this project does focus on students with disabilities, there is evidence that this um, the problems with assessment also has impacts on success for other students as well. So while we can come at it from this approach from disability, I think there's, there's a great, um, uh, in line with UDL, there's a great promise for students from broader diverse categories. And the other thing is that while I'm talking about exams today, we should also think about other types of assessments, essays, quizzes, group projects, oral presentations and placements. They can all potentially be problematic. However, exams definitely are the biggest category of thing that is um, that causes um, 
need for adjustments. So um, here's a graph of adjustments by assessment type from Deakin, um, which is, and this is data from 2018, um, which demonstrates that online tests and exams by far are the things that are most commonly mentioned in students' access plans. So what approaches could we take to make assessment more inclusive? Well, firstly, we need to move away from that deficit discourse where we say that students with disabilities have something wrong with them and they're the problem that needs to be fixed. We need to think rather about how assessment can be designed proactively to address diversity. So using universal design for learning and universal design for us of assessment, which sets out some principles in terms of what we might do differently to consider the range of um, capabilities that students have. The other thing um, to do in relation to assessment is actually to consider the assessment design more broadly. Take, um, and what I mean here is not just to think about the specific task or assessment as that exam that the student sits the, the or questions on the paper, but to think about the whole process of the assessment. So from who's involved to what the purpose is, to what the learning outcomes is, um, and um, how students might be involved. However, our previous work, uh, which was a systematic review of um, previous work in inclusive assessment, suggests that there was previously little evidence about what actually happened with students in exams and how students with disabilities experience exams to help us understand what could actually be done differently. So you kind of need to know a little bit about what's going on before we can make changes. So then the pandemic happened. And this is just a, a photo of uh, someone at uh, a COVID screening test site in a tent outside a car. So we thought we were um, going to think about exams in the way that we always thought about exams in large halls with everyone sitting exams at once. But then actually what happened was everyone moved online and um, exams looked a little bit different. And so in combination with that, we, we thought, well, actually, you know, there are still exams still taking place. They're just taking place a little bit different from what they did before. And we asked, could a social material lens better help us understand how inclusion might be enacted or not enacted in exams? And so social material theories conceptualize phenomena as dynamic interactions between spaces, objects, and people. And what this means is that instead of just thinking about the exam as a task on a piece of paper, we think about all the bits and pieces that are involved through time, through space, considering the relationships between, you know, what happens in the place where the student is. Um, there are still desks, there's still chairs. Um, there are perhaps more laptops and screens. Um, the roles of invigilators and administrators and students and teachers um, changed a little bit. But the, the overall idea here was to see how inclusion or exclusion could be um, experienced through the way that different social and material, so social being the people and material generally being objects, arrangements could contribute to inclusion or exclusion. And this is what happened in our successful grant um, for Neshi. So this was the approach we took. Um, and so you can access the whole final report um, at the Neshi website. Um, so our project research questions uh, and there were four of them, were firstly, what are the social and material arrangements that impact on inclusivity of high stakes timed assessments? And then within these high stakes timed assessment practices, how does disadvantage for students with disabilities intersect with other um, characteristics of diversity? Um, and then in the second part of the project, which is where we were doing workshops to try and make things change, we wanted to, we wanted to know well, which arrangements could be changed and does this actually result in more inclusive assessment design? So I'll talk a little bit about the student narratives first. Um, and we call them narratives because um, really students were, just wanted to share their stories. 
Uh, so we did interviews and we initially thought we'd only do 30 interviews with students. But what happened was we had so many um, students put up their hands or indicate their interest um, saying that they would like to be involved, that we expanded um, the number of interviews we were going to do to 40. Um, and we invited students from two uh, universities, uh, CQU and Deakin, and we invited them via um, the Disability Resource Centre at Deakin and the, the similar um, unit at CQU. Um, and what happened was, uh, while everyone did was obviously um, registered because they had some kind of condition or disability, we uh, identified that there were 25 from low socioeconomic backgrounds or they were the first in family to attend the university. And there were 21 of those students were from rural, regional or remote areas. So there's a lot of overlap in, in these um, markers of diversity, I suppose. And in terms of the conditions represented amongst these students, um, a number had a learning disability, some had a physical disability, uh, and some had medical and or mental health conditions. And some students, um, as you'll see when I'm presenting the findings, had more than one condition. So in addition to those 40 interviews, um, we realized we still couldn't interview everyone. So what we actually did was we invited students to submit a written response or a, a, um, a spoken response to the interview questions. And we actually had another 11 students uh, do this. Um, and the whole project had full um, human ethics uh, approval since the research focused on a vulnerable population. Um, and I like to note that with the quotes in the coming slides that all of them are presented with pseudonyms, um, but the conditions and the, and the area that students were studying are actually what they were. So what, what did inclusion look like? Well, it varied depending on the students, but also depending on a range of different um, arrangements. So some of it was around the social arrangements, some around the technology, uh, exam spaces and exam temporalities also changed and I think the the COVID overlay sort of highlighted some of these um, and task layout and configuration were also important. So I'll start with the social arrangements. So students um, really found that the actions, the way that other people within the university, within the institution um, interact with them really contributed to how they felt included. So Yasmin said, my units where I've been successful and I've received high distinctions, the difference was the unit chair and their empathy and flexibility. And I think that made the most difference to me. And Arlene also highlighted the role of the accessibility team. She says, I had a lot of support from the accessibility team. I felt like I was going to fail at one stage and they were just so supportive. They got me through it. And so it was those individual interactions between the students and the people on the team who are supporting them, who are trying to figure out, well, what's the best way that we can get you through this exam? What kind of things do you actually need? They were really important and made students feel like they could actually achieve and that they were um, legitimate members of the student body. Um, and Rosanna also highlighted how things outside of the university also impacted on that. So she says, with a disability and being a sole carer, I need to be highly organised to be able to do my academic best. I often need information quite in advance to be able to plan and prepare. So she was talking about the juggling of different things um, and how that the, the stuff um, in her life outside of university also impacted on how she felt included in the sense that the, those um, lecturers who sort of provided information about assessments at the last minute really made her feel like she was not um, one of the standard students who would, might be able to cope with things at the last minute. Technology was also really um, possibly more of, a, 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 of something that was noticed um, within this context of the pandemic. So um, a lot of things moved online and Rebecca, who studied law, reported, one of my assessments was a mock court for evidence law. I just found that really difficult to do because there was, all of this was on Zoom. I was struggling to hear people and there was a lag. So she had a medical condition and a mental health condition. 
Um, but in addition to this, the overlay of the technology was what made her feel like she wasn't really, uh, it wasn't really an inclusive experience. Um, and I think this really was about the technology uh, and how it was set up. Um, and a lot of other students also reported things around how the internet access was actually part of the dilemma in, in making them feel included. Um, and one student also reported that actually on the flip side, having um, the ability to use their own equipment at home was really helpful uh, in terms of uh, having access to the things that they knew would work for them. And so Samira here also points out that handwriting and speed is not my friend, even though my knowledge base is good. So she also really appreciated the switch to techno uh, technologically enabled exams where she could actually type things in. And that was um, something that perhaps would have been seen as a, a real adjustment previously that would have required you know, special arrangements, but now everybody had access to it. And so that made her feel included. Um, Students did um, identify contrasts between the previous ideas of exam spaces and their current experiences during the pandemic. Uh, so Ben pointed out that there's no distractions within the home environment. I have all the different software packages I need to be able to use, and I can just go and use my computer. It's essentially being within my own exam room, just being at home rather than at the university. I don't need to worry about my exam accommodations being ignored or something like that, or the room changing none of those problems occur. So he, Ben really felt that actually having um, online exams was a pretty inclusive move. And Olivia said, previously, when I had to go to the physical place, I would see other people also getting extra time and stuff to go have breaks. It was really nice to feel normal. And so that was a really interesting um, comment from her that she actually felt that seeing other students with similar condition, well, with similar exam conditions, um, made her feel more included. Whereas uh, perhaps being at home alone um, and only having that interaction with with the lecturer saying, "Oh, look, this is my accommodation. Can you please make sure I get an extra ten minutes or whatever it was?" Um, that felt more isolating. Um, and actually, being in the same space as other people um, who were also receiving accommodations um, was actually more inclusive for her. One thing that um, was really interesting for me that came up was around the temporalities of exams. And so students were really, um, uh, the, the way that time impacted the way that students felt about their exams um, was an interesting, well, has interesting implications for how we might design assessments. So Charlie says, one of my exams was more like an assignment. It came out on Thursday at 1 p.m. and it was submitted Friday at 1 p.m. Me and whoever I spoke to, we found that we were working on it from 1 o'clock until 9 p.m. They said it should take two hours, but it really took much longer and you just don't know when to stop. That, I found, wasn't really helpful. And so you can see here that um, with, with that idea of having, it was kind of like a short take-home assignment rather than a, a traditional exam and you could see that um, perhaps the the unit coordinators had tried to account for people um, being at their best at different times of day or having different obligations uh, so that they could actually just spend two hours within this 24-hour window working on the exam um, but this actually made things more stressful for students perhaps with different conditions um, because they knew that other students would probably be spending more time on it and so they felt obligated to spend more time on that exam um, and you know if if fatigue is part of the condition um, or they're just not able to work at particular times a day then that felt like it was less inclusive because they knew that it wasn't um, it wasn't an equitable experience however Lisa um, who also had a medical condition pointed out that um, with these sort of extended time frames if I wake up with a migraine I can drug up, download it, think about it, lay down for a bit, and then she laughed, and then come back and do it. So she she was really saying that actually having a little bit more flexibility in the time frame was really good for her condition. So getting down into the nitty gritty of the task layout, 
Um, Jacob uh, talked about how um, the actual format of the exam had an impact on how he felt about it. So he says, I definitely missed multiple choice. It is definitely the more relieving option because you have no idea what you're doing when you're typing things in and you always feel a little bit scared. And I note that David Hill, okay, yep. Um, just seeing the things in the chat. So Jacob was a first in family student and he did have a bit of anxiety test. Uh, he was saying he was quite an anxious around tests. Um, and he much preferred multiple choice, but of course, within um, the context of everything being online and um, easily searchable, uh, a lot of people moved away from multiple choice and that led to Jacob being um, a little less uh, confident about what was happening. Um, whereas Vicky um, pointed out that open book was being a really positive experience for her as it had forced the exam questions to be rewritten and focused on assessing understanding of the material rather than ability to memorize facts and figures. And I think this was something that quite a number of students pointed out in that um, having to memorize things and just having that quick recall was something that they found was not possible for them. And they actually really preferred assessments where they could demonstrate their understanding and demonstrate their capabilities um, in more meaningful ways. So a summary of this first phase of research around students' experiences was that many arrangements contributed to inclusion or inclusion exclusion. And there was actually no um, singular experience. Students love, love different things about different types of assessments. Um, and they also really recognised that there were particular things that they had to do in terms of for the discipline. Um, so for instance, you know, what, what, what would a health sciences student have to do if, or a health professional student have to do um, or a student working um, in a chemistry lab or um, doing law assessments. Um, they also recognised that university resources really impacted on what was possible. And also their student, their individual circumstances meant that um, some things were better for some students rather than others. But overall, we sort of got the sense that there were actually some things that were really just not great for everyone around the task design um, and around sort of requirements and how requirements were communicated and what latitude students had for um, adapting things to their own sort of needs. So in the phase two of the project, we really wondered, well, what could we actually change and what could we change in a short period of time? So the second part of the Neshi project was to run some workshops um, at both of the universities uh, to see, you know, to work with unit chairs uh, and unit um, teams on their assessments to see, well, you know, what are the most uh, sticky bits that could be changed? So what we did was that we identified enthusiastic people at uh, the two universities. This included unit chairs, academic developers. We invited along people from the access services team. So um, a few disability liaison officers actually joined us for the process. Uh, and we also uh, tried to identify students with previous experiences of those units to come along and um, talk about their specific experiences. We ran five workshops over four months and they were one to one and a half hours in duration um, and they were kind of more like meetings where we had some questions for everyone to reflect on prior to the workshops. Um, we really just had some discussion around a few resources. We recorded the workshops for consistency um, across the two institutions um, and we've tried to use a multiple case study design which you'll see in the report to look at what happened for each of those units. So across the five workshops, first one was really to get to know each other, to discuss ideas about equity inclusion. The second one was to explore how different people, the, the roles that they had within the university setting and the relationships in successful exams. And we really, we introduced some of the stories from the student experiences. In the third workshop, we talked about assessment design frameworks and how they might apply. Uh, in the fourth workshop, we introduced 
universal design for learning and how that could work in assessment. And then the fifth one, we reflected on the progress and challenges and identified what else could be done. Um, so to try and generate some things for the, that university system level as well. So I won't go through all of the workshop materials because that would take a while. Um, but I just wanted to acknowledge a couple of different things. Firstly, this is the assessment design decisions framework, um, which was developed by colleagues um, who are um, at Deakin and Melbourne, uh, Monash and Melbourne University now. Um, and this goes back to that broader consideration of assessment design, um, rather than just considering the task itself, which is still important. But so um, to think about the purposes of assessment, to think about the context in which the assessment occurs, to think about what feedback processes are available, which is something else that a few students brought up in that they would have really appreciated more information about how they were going along the way. Um, to look at the task, um, to consider what the learner outcomes are, and then to consider the interactions with other bits of assessment and other bits of the curriculum. And so this was what we asked um, our workshop participants to think about. And then we also asked them to think about UDL. And so um, I thought I'd provide just a brief um, example of how this works for assessment. So one of them, um, of the three things, first is providing multiple means of engagement. Um, and that's different ways of engaging with the learning resources. So when we transform this to think about assessment. We think about is there variety within the task itself? So different types of questions or topics to choose from so that students have something that, that is relevant to them to do as part of the assessment. To think about what materials would be necessary to support students to complete the assessment. Um, so what kind of learning resources, what other materials are required? Um, and how does the assessment encourage student self-regulation? So how, how, how does the assessment actually support and scaffold students to um, pursue what is interesting to them and to pursue um, the learning and demonstrating their capabilities in ways um, that they can um, determine themselves. The second arm of UDL is about multiple means of representation. And so within the assessment task, we um, sort of had pretty basic questions like, you know, will the assessment task include different options for different types of perception? So are we sharing the information about the assessment brief in a visual and an alternative form, like an auditory form? Um, a lot of um, uh, at Deakin, there, there's sometimes a requirement to, to post a little video at the start of the unit to welcome everyone. Um, and the feedback was that that's actually really helpful. So could we do a video, uh, a video introduction to the assessment as well as having that standard written assessment brief? Um, another prompt for, for our participants was, you know, how will the wording of the instructions clearly express what must be done and have the task being clearly explained? And can you, and under that is, can you communicate what's going on in that task in different ways um, so that students have different ways to access that representation of what the task is. And finally, um, the third aspect of UDL is around action and expression. And for this, um, we saw this as how students are actually responding to the task. So are there alternative ways that students can respond um, in the mode? So uh, written, spoken, something else, in the rates and timing and the volume. So, you know, could there be multiple tasks over a, um, a, a longer period of time that are smaller or would students actually prefer a larger task sort of closer to the end of the trimester? We also asked, you know, are there other opportunities for student choice in their response around the task or the mode? Um, and how does this task actually encourage students to engage in other learning activities across the unit in ways um, that are um, that they're capable of? And what course design decisions could actually mitigate students' anxiety about the assessment? So we will now shift to talk about what actually happened with these case studies. Um, and I'll provide a very brief overview here. And if you do want to look in detail at what happened across those four uh, units um, that is in the report. Overall, there were shifts in understanding through staff and student interactions. 
So one of the interesting things uh, we found was that um, unit chairs actually went for that Marie Kondo approach. So actually cleaning things up a little bit, reducing the content and changing their expectations to, to focus on the things that were really important for their unit. Um, some of the units shifted to use more scenario-based assessment to really link it with um, outcomes in the real world rather than it being abstract. And this was in direct response to some of those student narratives around um, how the students found that assessment that was meaningful for them potentially in their future roles was something that they could actually see would be more inclusive because it actually included who they were going to become. Um, some unit chairs also took the approach of developing students' assessment literacy, so actually spending a little bit more time talking about assessment throughout um, the course rather than just leaving the assessment task um, to stop there in that uh, assessment brief. Um, and there were also some changes to exam logistics, and this was particularly um, in the practical unit. So uh, one of the units used OSCEs, which is the Objective Structured Clinical Examination, which is particular to health professionals, um, education. Um, and some of the things that were happening within that process was seen as particularly not inclusive. And so things like allowing students to read the uh, exam prompt out aloud, because they were going to go into a practical station and actually have to perform a task, so actually reading the task out aloud and being able to make notes at that point was something that was in extremely inclusive and extremely easy to do. Um, and so when that change was made, it actually made um, everyone a lot less stressed. So there were some successes in those uh, case studies, but there were still also a lot of challenges. So existing assessment arrangements around um, the way that things were generally done within the unit or generally done within a course um, had a, a being the thing that was already done, um, there was a, a struggle to shift away from those things. And particularly uh, in relation to how uh, changes to assessment needed to be approved by particular committees uh, and overall um, considering the university operations of how exams run within universities and who um, has control over those things. Um, and another thing that unit chairs uh, found was um, around those individual interactions with students in, uh, and this goes back to having supportive relationships. Um, so students really reported that um, it would be great if they didn't have to go to every unit chair and say, oh, hi, you know, I've actually got accommodations. Would you be able to implement this for me? And unit chairs also agreed that that was, um, an incredible uh, time sink, important, but uh, they wish that there was another way that they could just easily understand who was in their unit uh, and what types of um, conditions that they were um, needed to particularly take into account in any given teaching period. Um, and so challenges around how information is transmitted and communicated between the different groups within the university was still one thing that was uh, really challenging that kind of sat alongside the assessment design um, that we couldn't really uh, make a change to. So what are the implications for inclusive assessment? What have we learned? Well, the project um, was really huge and um, I think the, the main thing that came out, of, came out of it for me was that making assessment inclusive is an ongoing process and it involves so many people who all have different roles um, and different priorities in what's most important and so to to, to elevate um, the concept of inclusive assessment um, to make it a priority for everyone uh, is a challenge and therefore we need to think about this at multiple levels so it can't just be just at that task design level, although task design, which supports diversity is really crucial and is one of the things that, you know, ultimately, if the task doesn't support students uh, to demonstrate their capabilities, then those students will not be able to, to succeed. We also need to think about those broader task conditions, which account for the different contexts in which students might be doing assessment and supporting staff and student interactions around assessment. So this, um, 
this goes to all those conversations that we that we have to have to to figure out who's in our cohort and what support do they need and also um, at that broader university level thinking about policy environments which do allow for the flexibility. So one of the things that did come up in our case studies was um, staff saying, oh, look, you know, we'd really love to be able to change things, but um, within the confines of the, the unit design, which has been approved and the assessment task, which we've already set out for this trimester, um, which had to be approved a year ago, we can't actually change this more than a little bit. So how we can incorporate more of that flexibility so that students can actually do different things is really uh, a question. The other implication for inclusive assessment is that um, from all of what the students told us about their assessment experiences and their exam experiences is that um, their disability was not separate from the rest of their lives. Um, they also had um, you know, carer responsibilities. Uh, they were perhaps living in a rural or regional area. And that also had an overlapping and intersectional impact on how they were able to attend, say, an exam location if they had to drive two hours and um, their condition meant that they couldn't sit for that long in a car. It was That was a challenge um, on top of the challenges that already existed. So, um, these types of problems and problems with poor assessment design are amplified for diverse students. So really when we think about improving assessment for students with disabilities, they're actually likely to support many diverse students. And again, this goes back to that concept of universal design for learning, where uh, we should be thinking about how things can support everyone across the board rather than only being accessible to a specific group of students. And so when we think about the important ingredients uh, that might shift things towards this direction, firstly, the, the thing that came out of our project was that time and space for discussions to work through these design processes was really important. We had um, a luxury of you know, over five hours talking to people to work on their assessment designs and, and muddle through all their dilemmas. Um, and this is something that's challenging and requires support at faculty and university levels to actually you know, um, recognise that we need time to spend on changing assessment. We can't just repeat the same thing over and over. Um, another important ingredient we found was having everyone in the room together. So student voice was really important and, ha and um, even though we had the collected um, experiences of 50 something students from that first phase, of our workshop, uh, of our um, project. When we went to the workshops, having a student in the room at that point saying, oh, well, actually that wouldn't work. Or actually, what about this? Or that's still gonna be problematic for these reasons was really impactful for everyone else in the room. We also found that the disability liaison officers had a wealth of information um, and experience about things that had been done in the past and what would work and what wouldn't work. So that was really valuable and I don't think um, our unit chairs had um, many opportunities to actually have those direct discussions before. So it was really, really beneficial. Um, and finally, having a safe environment for incremental changes. We hear a lot of the time that's, that people are afraid to make changes to their unit design to their assessment because that might have an impact on their teaching evaluations. Um, and we did have assurances that um, the units in the project would be supported and that um, actually you know, taking the step to make the change was a very brave move that, that um, would be acknowledged. Um, so finally, very quickly, um, we did create a range of resources available via the project website and Kylie is uh, very kindly putting the links into the chat. So firstly, um, that's our project website. Uh, on There are basically um, three uh, short, PDF documents plus a set of workshop materials. The first, um, the first resource is a five top tips for inclusive exam design, um, which are all really basic things, but might help people who haven't had much um, 
interaction or, or thought about these things before to think about ways in which um, exams could be made more inclusive if you still have to have an exam. The second um, resource is the Inclusive Assessment Framework and Development Lifecycle, which actually sort of steps things out in that broader consideration of assessment design. Um, and this is um, backed up by two principles. Firstly, that assessment should credential or develop capability in relation to learning outcomes uh, and not focus on extraneous attribute skills or behaviours. And secondly, that assessment should support diverse students to demonstrate what they know and what they can do in a way that benefits their development without unfair barriers. And so these two principles, the first one is really around that equity and focusing on the things that are important um, from a university perspective. And the second principle is really about acknowledging how students have a, a big role to play um, and that assessment really is for students to learn. And so we should be supporting them to learn the things that they are, um, they, they see important for their future roles, whatever they might be, and that, um, that they can demonstrate their capabilities in the ways that they are able to do, which may not be the traditional, um, you know, two hour timed essay. And finally, that last document is about institution-wide strategies. If you are able to speak to people who are uh, at that policy leadership level um, around creating a culture of inclusion, supporting reimagining of exams, which I understand is also useful from a budgetary perspective since exams are quite expensive to hold. Um, improving clarity of inclusive assessment processes, so really around those processes and procedures. Um, including streamlining access uh, and how access plans are developed um, and promoting evaluation. So no one's going to care about it unless we have some kind of metric target or KPI to meet around inclusive assessment. So that's something we should uh, advocate for. And the last thing that I mentioned was around workshop materials. Now in their current format, they're, they're pretty basic, but there are some um, preparation resources, there are slides for those five workshops and they are um, Creative Commons licensed. So you can take them away and do whatever you want with them if you um, are in the position to be able to go away and work with others uh, on this um, area. So thanks for your attention. I've been watching the chat fly by. Um, I know Darlene's got some questions already and I can see there are more questions in the Q&A. So um, thanks very much for your attention and your contributions in the chat and yeah, look forward to your questions. <clears throat> Thank you, Joanne. And yeah, look, the, the conversation has it's kind of been quite um, challenging wanting to listen to you, but also engage in the conversation. It's been great and there's been some robust discussions there, but we do have a few questions. Um, before I ask, and I'm not going to get to them all, um, Alicia will put um, into the link, if you want to learn more about Universal Design for Learning, Adset has um, web content and we also have an e-learning resource that people can undertake um, um, if they'd like to um, learn more about Universal Design for Learning. And we also have some great um, things coming up like a symposium and so forth. So also Alicia will put in the link to our newsletter if you don't already subscribe to our newsletter to hear more about what's available. Okay, so looking at the, the voting, um, of all the questions and we've had got quite a lot of questions 12 um probably the most popular question was around and now it seems to have disappeared oh oh no here um can you can you give an example of how to balance flexibility to support students with disability and equity among all students please how do educators make sure they don't disadvantage other students while providing support to a particular group of students like students with disability. So that got 16 upvotes. I'd love to answer it myself, but I'm going to leave it to you, Joanna. Um, okay, I'm, 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 it's a curious perspective. So how do educators make sure they don't disadvantage other students while providing support? Um, I guess maybe it's perhaps this question comes from the perspective that there are particular things we need to do extra for students with disability um, rather than coming back to the position um, I would I would walk it back from having to do extra uh, because I don't think anybody's got time to do extra really realistically and um, I know there was another question yes this is higher education that I've, I've been talking about um, I think um, in the media and everywhere else people are sort of recognizing that tutors lecturers are all sort of stretched um, 
And so I, I think we're probably more in danger of neglecting students with disabilities rather than being able to be in a position where we can actually provide extra support. Um, but the, the, the point of trying to take this different perspective of looking at um, inclusion and um, how exams can be inclusive was really to sort of reduce the need to provide extra support for any particular group where possible. Um, I don't think we can ever get rid of um, accommodations and adjustments um, because there will always be people who um, need something a little bit different from what might work for the majority of the population. Um, but okay, I'm seeing some some things in the chat. Uh, you know how, how we <laughs> it's gonna... hard not to get distracted, isn't it? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, but, but yeah, I think I, I agree with Cassandra. He says modifications are about removing barriers to engagement, not making it easier for some students. Yeah. Um, and also, um, I think having um, a better understanding of everyone. So knowing your students, I think, is the, the first part of this is knowing everyone who's in the cohort so you can actually proactively plan for things that will take into account students um, who um, who maybe are hearing impaired or visually impaired um, of planning things so that you don't just um, have a whole bunch of pictures without um, alt text attached um, so doing things so that you don't have to go back and do the extra work afterwards no, and so really and so things like um, some students in in another project were saying oh look you know I did have this exam but the exam asked me to describe a picture and it was within a um, particular exam platform which my screen reader which do, did not work with so for a student who was blind they a couldn't access the exam platform properly um, because a lot of things were implemented very quickly in the pandemic so I, I kind of understand from that perspective that things just didn't go through the normal processes but secondly they couldn't actually do the question because the question asked them to do something that was impossible for them um, and so thinking about those things from the outset means that you don't have to go back and go oh well now I need to create a special exam for that person um, and that's yep. part of the universal design Yep, definitely. And it's also that other, you know, the, the word I suppose I often use is that level, level playing field. It's not actually doing anything extra. It's actually putting students on the level playing field with each other. And I think that's kind of a cultural shift we sometimes need to make within education, that it's not special or different. It's actually just putting people on the same playing, playing field so they are equal. Um, the next one um, probably was seven um, ups, was um, university students come to higher education from secondary school where adjustments uh, for example, um, uh, allowed like under the Queensland, I think AARA, I, I'm not familiar with Queensland's um, K to 12 um, process. So, but if students um, is used to these adjustments and that they, then they're not provided at uni, this could result in stress. So the question is, if, do unis study what is provided in secondary schools with adjustments? Did that come up in your research at all? Um, oh, that's a really interesting question. So I haven't done any study on what secondary schools provide with adjustments, but a number of the students who um, participated in the, in, in the interviews said things like, well, I already had these adjustments at secondary school. So it was actually pretty easy for me to go to the University Disability Resource Centre and say, look, this is what I had previously. This was my plan. Um, here's the supporting documents. Um, can we do something similar here? And the disability liaison officers were like, great, everything's already set up. We know what works for you. We'll just keep on doing that. And so where students had good links um, and good support, um, it worked really well to have similar things carried across. Um, but there were other students who didn't really get that support. Like they knew they had a condition while they were at secondary school, but no one really supported them well. And they didn't know that there was a place at the university that they could go to, to that where they could get a similar support. Um, so part of, part of the problem I think was also around um, everyone knowing what's available at a particular institution and everyone uses a different terminology for, for what they're, I mean, I call it a disability resource centre, but I don't think that's um, standard across across all institutions. So even knowing who to go to at the university was is part of that um, issue. Yep, excellent. 
Um, look, there, once again, there's still some great conversation happening. Um, just the other one that's got the most votes is um, currently we have a course that includes a presentation assessment as presentation skills are, are cru crucial for the student in this profession. However, stu some students may request accommodations due to anxiety when presenting in front of the class. How can I strike a balance between inclusivity and authenticity? I see that Penny Robinson has already responded to this question. Yep. Thank you, Penny. <laughs> you are amazing. I, I, I didn't pick the, put the thing down, but yes. Um, uh, I agree with what Penny has said. Um, I think part of uh, another thing that um, I've, I've been thinking about for a while is that actually, yes, certainly we expect students to have skills by the end of their course or by the end of the unit but how are we supporting them during their learning to actually develop these skills um, I think anxiety is is very uh, it is common and it is more of a problem for some people who have real you know a, a real condition um, that said some of these students in our research said well you know I understand that I'm going to have to do this in the future so these students actually want to be able to develop these skills. So it is not just about what happens at that end point of assessment, but how can we support them ahead of time in smaller chunks? As Patty says, you know, can they record it? Can they present to a smaller audience? Can they present just to the lecturer? Um, I know that the ultimate skill is probably presenting to a large audience, but how can we support students to build up to that point rather than just saying, you've got to be able to do it from day one? Yep, excellent. Well, looking at the time, we've got a lot of questions. Joanna said she's happy to spend some time answering the questions afterwards. So we might try to set some of the questions, you know, get them together and, and Joanna will provide the answers to us, which we'll put on the website. So, and um, we'll send out an email to everybody. It was fabulous. Um, we had 220 people attend today and we had 480 register to receive the webinar um, link afterwards. So a really popular topic um, and look, the conversation has absolutely been brilliant. I, I really um, love that people have answered the questions and put in extra links into the chat. It's what it's all about. I think um, this technology is, um, you know, people are getting better, you know, more and more confident with the using of the technology and sharing their wisdom across the platform. So thank you, Joanna, for your time today. It's absolutely brilliant. Um, it was great, great to see the presentation. I think we let you know that the, the presentation will be on the website as well as the links that um, are relevant that Joanne has spoken to you about. Um, our next webinar is called Building Host Organisations Cap um, Capacity to Provide Safe and Equitable Work in integrated learning for students with disability. That'll be on the 6th of July. So um, a link will go into the chat now if you'd like to register for that, um, which is absolutely wonderful. Um, we will, as I said, have lots of um, other uh, sessions coming up in the near future around um, around universal design for learning. I think there was one comment of around the research um, and not necessarily being, you know, the research isn't in and it's not evidence-based at this stage. Certainly hoping that there will be more research and evidence around universal design for learning and the impact it can have um, on the student cohort in the, the coming years. And we're certainly looking at um, connecting with our international colleagues too and getting that evidence as well. But there's many ways to support inclusive teaching and support um, and support across the, the tertiary sector. And that's what we're here to do is promote all of those ways. So thank you, Joanna. Thank you for everybody for, for joining in and thank you for the chat and questions. I wish we could put a couple of hours into this. I think we could have kept talking, but um, yeah, for now we'll finish up and, and thank you everybody. Thanks.